He was once perhaps the most influential lobbyist in the country. Prime ministers, premiers, and more than a thousand chief executives listened attentively to his advice. In fact, at one point, someone referred to him as the, quote, de facto prime minister of the country. And it wasn't meant as a compliment. Thomas D'Aquino chronicles his time trying to influence public policy in Canada in his new memoir. It's called Private Power, Public Purpose, Adventures in Business, Politics, and the Arts. And it brings the former head of the Business Council on National Issues to our studio tonight. And it's great to have you in that chair. Welcome. Steve, pleasure to be here. I want to start with your name, because your father always told you, honor your name. Right. You're obviously named after St. Thomas Aquinas. Right. What's the story there? Well, the story is that uh, the family name goes back, obviously, a long, long time. And uh, I happen to be named Thomas. Uh, and as you know, it carries the weight of history uh, in the sense that more often in Europe uh, than in North America, when I'm introduced as Thomas de Quino, people say, yes, I mean, can it really be the, your name? <laughs> so, but my father always used to say, a name means something. And uh, since this particular name has historical importance, I expect you to honor the name. That's, you know, where it came from. Gotcha. You, I guess, started your political affiliation in Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's office. Right. Long, long time ago. What did you do for him? Well, I was, a, uh, I was a junior member of the staff, but I wrote speeches. I worked on organizational memos. I did briefing notes. It was sort of a, a general ragbag of responsibilities that I had, and it was great fun. It was a wonderful time to be in government. Did you like him? I did. I, like is perhaps not so much the word, uh, the, the word that I would use, uh, Steve, but I would say I hugely admired him because... I was not one of these young liberals with shiny uh, liberal credentials. When I went to work uh, for him, uh, I saw him as the philosopher king. And because he was greatly interested in the Constitution and some of these esoteric issues that I was interested in, it was more of a, a, a an academic admiration than perhaps a political admiration. Well, this is why I asked the question, because, of course, you gained your reputation as being a guy deeply and you know, interested and focused on economic issues. Right. And he was not. I mean, Clear. he was very focused on Philosopher King issues, justice, constitution, and so on. Did that take some of the shine off him for you? It certainly did by the end of the, the time that I worked with him, when it became very clear to me that the economy was not a top priority for him. And when in the latter part of that, the first time he uh, lost and Joe Clark, as you know, became uh, prime minister, in that particular moment, there was considerable economic dissatisfaction in the country. And I think that that was a reflection of the fact that he himself did not consider it a priority. Constitutional issues, even China, Extending mm. diplomatic relations with China mm. in that early period was one of the official languages. These were bringing French Canada to the center of the nation. These were very, very important achievements on the part of Pierre Trudeau. Joe Clark, we should add, your former university roommate. <laughs> right. <laughs> right on. Okay. 1977, there's a lobby group in the country called the Business Council on National Issues, and they asked you for your opinion of them, and you told them you thought they were very unimpressive. How did they react to that? Not well. Uh, I sent. I was an advisor to the to the nascent business council, and I rather cheekily uh, sent a note saying that the sleeping leviathan should wake up. And I was summoned to the Mount Royal Club in Montreal uh, by the then titans of business, the heads of CPR, Ian Sinclair, Paul Demaray Sr., really quite a collection. Earl McLaughlin of the Royal Bank. And, um, and when I said, look, times are changing, the old boys club in the future is not going to work. And I remember Ian Sinclair looking at me and saying, what are you talking about, Tom? He said, when I want to speak to Pierre, I just pick up the phone and call him and Earl can do this with the prime minister or with the governor of the Bank of Canada. What's all this nonsense? I stood my ground. Uh, and when I walked out of the room, I thought I'd have been fired as an advisor. Shortly thereafter, they invited me to lunch again, and they offered me the job. There you uh, go. So there you are. Uh, convinced that I was fired, but in fact, I was hired. A lot of business executives were, and still are, afraid to speak out on the big issues of the day because right. they fear angering politicians or losing market share or whatever. Should they have that fear? No, they should certainly not. 
And uh, Steve, when I took on the role of the business council, uh, it's not that these individuals who were very, very forceful people, um, it's not that they were afraid of government. They either tended to ignore government or would get angry if governments didn't do what they wanted. But there was no such thing. And I can speak to this because when I was in the prime minister's office, I saw what was a dearth of consultation. There was no such thing as business leaders reaching out even in areas such as taxation and uh, trade, let alone getting into areas that were farther uh, afield. So my maiden speech, I argued, number one, you have to be engaged. Uh, number two, we have, to be, we have to do serious work on public policy issues to be taken seriously. Number three, we can't just focus on the predictable. Uh, and that's when they began to accept the idea that we would go to areas such as the environment. For example, defense policy, which had not been looked at by business since the, the war, but, but also very important that um, we be nonpartisan. Uh, absolutely crucial. And if you said to me at that particular time, were the majority of the 100 plus CEOs more liberal than conservative? I would say probably yes. I would say that most of them probably voted liberal. That's because the, the Liberal Party had a business wing in it back then. Exactly, exactly. You know, on the, the carry-on from C.D. Howe, mm -hmm. the symbiotic relationship between business and government in that respect. But the idea that they should uh, not only be nonpartisan, but take a very active role was very new. But there was one other really important thing, Steve, and that is the, uh, the principle of shareholder value. Uh, the the steps that we took at that time, I would argue, I do argue in the book, were revolutionary because the assumption was that Milton Friedman's principles, that it's all about shareholder value, mm -hmm. and if any CEO is caught dabbling in anything else, you're not doing your job and you should be fired. So this idea that we should go towards stakeholder capitalism was, I would argue, a very seminal departure at that particular period. I, and today, of course, it's taken for granted. I was going to say, history has proven you were writer than Mr. Friedman well, on that one. Oh, at least so far. So far, okay. <laughs> I want to ask you about one of the more memorable moments uh, on Parliament Hill where you got yourself into a little bit of trouble. And this was, uh, you've talked about this in the book, and it's a good story. Brian Mulroney's the Prime Minister. He's cornered on Parliament Hill by a senior citizen who's told him that he's gone back on his word because Mr. Mulroney always pledged he would never the index seniors pensions right he'd always keep that inflation protection in there and a little old lady cornered him on the hill and said you know you went back on this and next time for you it's going to be goodbye charlie brown right and you got asked apparently whether you supported the de-indexing of seniors pensions and you said no you didn't michael wilson the then finance minister called you up and accused you of effing up the government's plans although right. i'm not sure he said effing uh, Bill Fox, who was a Mulroney advisor, said he wanted to rip your heart out for saying what you said. Were you disloyal to the Conservative government on that occasion? That's the question. Well, it, to me, it was never a question of disloyalty mm. because I never saw, you know, on this, coming back to this issue of nonpartisanship, mm. uh, that to me was an absolutely baked in principle. And that is that every, everything we stood for had to be what we believed. But and they thought you were one of them. Some of them thought that yeah. we were one of them. And in fact, uh, Brian Mulroney in his memoir said when, you know, they decided to pull back from the, the major measures in that budget, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, even the reliable <laughs> BCNI could not be counted on. Yeah. So, uh, and incidentally, Michael Wilson, who uh, I, uh, was a great, we developed a great friendship over time. And my wife, Susan, worked with him for many years. Um, yes, he did use the effing word. He was, I've never seen him uh, so angry because it was Mulroney's first budget, Wilson's first budget, and the stand down was, in their mind, acutely embarrassing. But we had said clearly over and over again, mm -hmm. we will support uh, moves to cut the deficit, but it should not be done on the backs of, uh, of the poor or mm -hmm. uh, people who simply could not afford to take the hit. And we had recommended a way of doing it they didn't follow our advice, and there we are. So my telephone calls, I didn't get any telephone calls. I was frozen <laughs> out for a good six to eight months. You were, on the other hand, a big booster of Brian Mulroney's free trade agreement with the United States, right. and you were very unhappy with the then liberal leader, John Turner's uh, very fierce opposition right. to that agreement. And you said in the book that your relationship with Turner, which before that had been pretty good, 
basically hit rock bottom at that point. Did you two ever have a rapprochement? Actually, we did. It was a, it, it was a surprising moment. We were attending uh, the funeral of a man called John Grace, who was a very close friend of John Turner. Oh, from way back in Ottawa. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh, while we were at the uh, post-funeral reception, um, of all people, Alan McKechn, who I did not know that well. Another liberal cabinet That's minister. right. came up to me and he said, come on over and say hello to John. And I was, I was on the other side of the room. And when I went over to see him, uh, he reached out his hand and so did I. And he said, let's, Tom, let's put, by God's, let's put, let, you know, let's put this behind us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always thought that John Turner was a very classy guy. And, uh, and I thought that that was a very generous thing for him to do. There were some people in the country at this time who thought you had way too much influence right. with way too many prime ministers. Right. Did you? Did it feel that way to you? Well, I, uh, Steve, I felt that at least, you know, my, my letters have responded and we, we had pretty good two-way conversations, uh, some more with some than, than others. Uh, but I also had to pay a price for that because I was demonized by the left. Um, I was burned in effigy in front of the Chateau Laurier. Uh, cow dung was dumped on my driveway. Uh, death th the rats came by the dozens. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. I never had any security, but only to say that, as I say in the book, you know, the pursuit, the principal pursuit of uh, good public policy um, in the face of everything uh, often does carry a price, but that's all right if you believe in what you're doing. Do you, I, I, I well remember when somebody called you the de facto prime minister of the country. I did not like that. You didn't like no, it? No, I did not like that at all. And uh, when Peter Newman in, in, in his writings, you know, referred to me as the greatest single power in policy formation and history, which of course was total nonsense. <laughs> Those kind of things, uh, I, if there were things that kept me awake at night, it's, it's when people referred to me as the de facto prime minister. I considered every time that anything like that was said, it was a failure rather than an achievement. <laughs> you often tried to get governments to cut taxes. And here is an excerpt from your book on that. Sheldon, if you would, bring this graphic up. Finance Minister Paul Martin heard me say that a $100 billion tax cut would massively boost Canadian competitiveness. This led to a late evening telephone call from the minister. He was fuming. Tom, he said, what have you been smoking? Where am I going to find $100 billion? <laughs> okay, I want to ask you about that because federal and provincial governments over the course of the last couple of decades would end up cutting corporate taxes significantly. And one of the things that, you know, we were told would happen if they did that was that there would be this great investment in hiring people, new jobs, retooling plants, uh, reinvesting the money in themselves and so on. And I well remember Jim Flaherty, the former conservative finance minister, saying they didn't do any of that. In fact, they sat on all that dead money and paid themselves bigger dividends. And he was not happy about that. Right. Did business act selfishly on those occasions? Complex question, but it requires a very direct answer. Uh, the answer is that business didn't do enough uh, of that. But it's not because the CEOs with whom I worked were shy about wanting to invest in Canada. I mean, by this time, major Canadian companies had begun to develop. Unlike when I took over the council where multinationals were dominant. Uh, so every red-blooded Canadian who runs a major company wants to employ people and grow the company in Canada. Uh, we didn't always have the best circumstances to do that. The idea of sitting on dead money is anathema to most of the CEOs that I've worked with, because if you do that, you're not doing your job and your shareholders are not gonna be very happy. And what the financial press writes about you is not gonna be very complimentary. So I would say that the impediments to investment or the long record of slow growth that we've had in Canada is due to a number of factors. Uh, you might say, well, were the CEOs entrepreneurial enough? Mm -hmm. I would argue that a, quite a few of them were. Uh, did they face impediments or did they have to deal with an environment in the United States that was vastly more attractive? Hence my argument, in addition to free trade, cutting the GST, all magnificent policy achievements, we also had to go the next step with tax cuts. And to the great benefit of the, certainly the Martin Kretjan government, 
uh, those tax cuts, in fact, were implemented. So when the minister asked me, what have you been smoking, Tom? <laughs> we knew that not $100 billion in one year, $100 billion over a decade was eminently doable. And, they, and to their great credit, they did it. And it made a difference in Canada. But having said that, do you think you empowered some of your political adversaries who would have looked at you and said, there he goes again, he's only advocating for big fat business and he's not doing anything for the country? Well, uh, my counter argument to that uh, is that, um, and, and I, I know it's very difficult, Steve, to make the argument that you're, all of our public policy moves were aimed at achieving a better country. But this goes right to the very philosophy of what I stood for way back then and still do now. The role of capital is not the enhancement of capital. The role of capital is to achieve a better society. Because this idea, coming back to Milton Friedman, if it's only about enriching a limited number of shareholders, which is a fraction of the total population, you're clearly not doing your job. And if I look at the amount of taxes that the large companies have, have paid, if I look at what is stakeholder capitalism now, and that is what over the last 10, 15, and 20 years companies have been doing to become better corporate citizens, far from a perfect record, but I would say not one where the left or anyone could say, you know, you people are only interested in one thing, and that is profit. I, I would argue very strongly against that. And that book is full of examples, uh, in my view, of where we tried to do things that would make for a better country, even if it meant uh, having less in profit, even if it meant that our immediate shareholders might not always be happy with what we were doing. One example, sir. Well, one example would be uh, looking at the oil industry. The oil industry, which is vilified, uh, the oil industry, I would argue, has been not only a huge provider of taxes, the largest single provider of taxes to the national purse, and you say to yourself, well, where do those taxes go? They go to schools, they go to health care, they go to education, they go to all these benefits. What are these taxes used for? It's not that we are grossly undertaxed in Canada, uh, but those are major sources of revenue that help build a better society. We would not be doing these things if people were not paying what I would call their fair share of taxes. Back in 2014, the then called University of Western Ontario, now Western University in London, gave you an honorary degree. Yes. And you gave some advice to some of the kids who were there. Shall we play some of that? Sheldon, the clip, if you would. My experience in Mr. Trudeau's office showed me several things about leadership. That it is lonely at the top, that the physical demands of high office can be excruciating, that the buck really does stop on the leader's desk, and that a leader's hold on power can be extraordinarily ephemeral. I want to just uh, have that kickstart a bit of a conversation with you about who the best and worst politicians you enjoy dealing with, or maybe not so much over the years, were. Who's the most effective, best prime minister you dealt with in your time? I would say that, uh, as you know, you've read the book and you see that I've laid on some pretty heavy compliments on virtually all of the prime ministers who had strengths. I would say the prime minister who had the most accomplished record, as in the introduction of major policy decisions that really mattered, would be Brian Mulroney. For business or for the country as a whole? For the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would put Jean Chrétien as a close second. And why do I say that? I say that because the holy grail of good public policy I think was best exemplified in the moves of Brian Mulroney on free trade, GST. Don't the Americans wish they could have done their equivalent of a GST? And Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin for having turned around Canada's abysmal fiscal situation in the early 90s and the come hell or high water budget of Mr. Martin took Canada, which had the worst record in the G7, and turned it into the best record. And that combination of free trade, tax reform, and fiscal responsibility put Canada on a path of repeated uh, surpluses right up until, in, well into Harper, and right up until the great financial crisis of 2008. Who was the most frustrating prime minister to deal with? The most frustrating? Um, 
Well, you know, Steve, I it, it's hard for me to say that because I don't think I was terribly frustrated by any prime minister. I found that Jean Chrétien was a man who marched to his own drum uh, and, and did it, I think, with... Uh, <laughs> I always admired him, you know, the little guy from Shawinigan. But uh, I don't think frustration in the sense that, I would say perhaps Stephen Harper, if one used the word frustration in the sense that was there a warmer relationship? No, there was not. But I did say publicly that the relationship with Harper was exactly what I think the relationship between the business um, leaders of the country and the government should be. It should be correct. It should be strictly nonpartisan. It should be at arm's length. It should not be too chummy. Uh, our relationship with Mulroney, and even to some extent with Craytown, was more chummy than it was with Harper. But I did not lament the Harper relationship because I think that's the ideal relationship is a correct arm's length relationship so that nothing is expected of you and you do not expect anything of them other than what can come out of legitimate two-way discussions on what is good policy and what isn't. Dozens of premiers you would have dealt with during your time. Who yeah. was the best one to deal with? Oh, I would say Peter Lougheed would be there and Jean Chrétien, uh, and Jean Charest. I would say my two favorite premiers in that 30, 40 year period probably would be uh, Lougheed and, and Charest. And the worst? Um, and the worst. Uh, <laughs> I, well, there, there, uh, There's so many you can't figure well, out which one there, should take the crown. No, I mean, but you know, there, <laughs> well, isn't it amazing? Because my mind automatically goes to the good. Roy Romano, NDP, is someone I hugely admire mm. because he was a very progressive, uh, central-leaning, New Democratic Party leader. I would rate him certainly in my top three or four. Um, uh, Gordon Campbell. Gordon Campbell, to me, from British Columbia, is a man who could have been an effective prime minister. So I tend to look at those. The others maybe don't, you know, maybe they're not so much front of mind because they don't, they don't rank up there the way these three or four or five premiers did. Okay. You left the Business Council in 2009, and here's how L. Ian McDonald described your farewell party in the Ottawa Citizen. Here we go. The marathon five-hour tribute evening on Monday at the National Gallery of Canada was organized a lot more along the lines of a state dinner than a retirement party. It was, in fact, a unique gathering of the Canadian establishment. No one would be surprised if Democracy Watch demanded the guest list and howled at the outrage of the corporate elite rubbing shoulders with the political class. The people who own the country socializing with the ones who run it. How sensitive are you to the criticism that you're an elitist who just wants to rub shoulders with the rich and powerful? Uh, very sensitive about it. Uh, incidentally, at the very same event, uh, people like um, Elizabeth May were present. Uh, the leader, the then leader of the opposition, Stefan Dion, was there. Uh, you, you may say, well, these, these people are all elites anyway. And in your book, you talk about going to Davos 18 or 19 times. Uh, and a gathering that some political leaders in this country have said is anathema. We will never go there. It is forbidden. Please, who could you they, be referring to with that I don't comment? know. This is what I call the burn the books crowd. I mean, you know, um, so the, the inescapable thing that you raise is you cannot do what I did over the last 40 years and claim when you're walking with powerful people, claim that somehow, some way you're not... Um, cannot be rightfully uh, described as an elitist. I don't like that term. I don't like the association with it, but it is a reality. And that's why in my chapter on leaders and leadership, I talk about the major characteristics of what a true leader is. One of them, you know, along with knowledge, empowerment of others, character, ambition, one of them is humility. Have I always succeeded in pursuing what my what my mother said to me, incidentally, the night before she died, she said, Tom, worry about the poor. The rich can look after themselves. That was my next question. Oh my look God. at it. It's right there. Well, there you, you are. You anticipated it well. And, and did so you always take her words to heart? I, I, I tried to, but was I, did I achieve perfection? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when you're flying around in private jets and you're going off to Davos and you're working with these kind of people, it comes with the territory. And the way I tried to respond to that, Steve, and this comes straight from the heart in the book, I tried to respond to that by saying that the 
policy priorities that I uh, tried to achieve, I always argued that there was a social dimension to it. Because when I came back to Canada, I'd had the advantage of participating in the very first of the corporate social responsibility audits mm -hmm. when I was working in London. And I came back convinced that corporate social responsibility had to be the new a mantra of corporate leadership, not only in Canada, but throughout the world. I mean, it is that now, perhaps more successfully in some countries than in others. But I always believed in that. And did I always succeed? No, I did not. Was I always humble? No, I was not. Uh, I was a, did I at times come across as a braggart? Probably yes. I, I'm, an, I'm an imperfect individual who tried very, very hard to be a good leader. Well, here's what you have to say about Canada today. Let's pluck another quote out of the book here. You write, my Canada suffers from complacency. In far too many areas of endeavor, we satisfy ourselves with bronze and silver rather than aspiring to gold. Extremism and hate have made their debut in our political discourse. We were once a country renowned for its great construction achievements, railways, dams, pipelines, and seaways. Now we seem to have lost our capacity to think big and deliver even bigger. More than two decades ago, I boldly stated that we should shape a Canada that is, quote, the best place in the world to live, to work, and to invest, and to grow. We are not there yet. In your view, what's the most significant reason we're not there yet? Uh, it, it comes, it's two, two words from uh, the Roman writer Horace, and it's carpe diem. We are, first of all, I do believe, and I'm challenged on this, particularly these days, I do believe that this is the finest country in the world, but it's a country with imperfections. And the imperfections, you've already identified some of them. And I, and I think it's a failure to think big. And I know we have constraints today that perhaps we didn't have at the time that First World War, you know, a population of 8 million people raising an, amar, an army of 650,000. I mean, some of the remarkable things that we have done. But now uh, it's, I think, a lack of ambition. And I would say the reason for it is complacency. You know, we go to bed at night knowing that the Americans will protect us. Instead of meeting our 2% target with NATO, we're at 1.27. Mm -hmm. Repeatedly, we have said, and we have argued, and many have argued, that we should be carrying, uh, you know, uh, punching our weight or above it uh, in defense policy. We are pathetically weak at being able to defend our own country, and yet we're so reliant on the Americans. Uh, the East-West divide. We should be both an energy superpower and an environmental superpower. The two things do, in fact, go together. It's a symbiotic relationship. Still, we have this great division in the country. Those who say, well, you know, you've heard it many times over. Um, the political hatred that's come into the system, uh, largely imported from the United States, disturbs me greatly. I don't like it. I don't like what I'm seeing there. Mm -hmm. And um, so whether it's defense policy or whether it's health care, which is struggling, you know, we, we, complacency. But you and I have heard for decades excellent solutions to the health care problems we have today. In the section I did on the nurses, I, I showed what I'd learned from that exercise, a whole year exercise on a commission with nurses. And I realized that other countries are doing it vastly better, that we ourselves have come up with many, many public policy solutions, but we don't act on them. This is a country that is brilliant at developing good public policy papers, but very, very bad at execution. That's my, that's my concern. So carpe diem, seize the day. Seize the day. Gotcha. With all of the political people you've hung around with in your life, did you ever think about running yourself? <laughs> I did briefly. Uh, Steve, when I, uh, when I um, was working in Prime Minister Trudeau's office, uh, I toyed around with the idea, wouldn't it be nice to run in my, the constituency where I grew up, although it had always voted NDP, or most of the time, uh, in the southeastern corner of British Columbia, or maybe even on the West Island of Montreal, where I'd spent some time. Um, but having looked, after having seen politics up close, from that apex of power that I was privileged to work in, Mr. Trudeau's office, uh, I saw how brutal it was, how demanding it was, and I came to the conclusion then that I probably wouldn't practice black letter law. I wouldn't go off and be a full-time professor of law, although I did do some teaching, but I wanted to have an impact on the public policy environment, and the best way to do it would be as, as, as an entrepreneur. Go out 
create my own company and do it. And that's what I did uh, just after I came back from a period of time in London and Paris and set up my own, uh, my, my own multidisciplinary consulting firm. And I'm not sorry that I went down that road. When I look back on it now, am I glad that I didn't go into politics? Yes. Am I glad that I'm not a full-time law professor? Yes. <laughs> am I glad that I did what I did? I have no regrets, except for, as I said, the cow dung on the, <laughs> on, on the, on the driveway. <laughs> Uh, okay, I've known you a long time, so I'm going to uh, presume upon our relationship to ask you a bit of a personal question here, which is, do you think you were able to achieve all of what you did achieve in your professional life because you didn't have kids, and therefore, that was not the distraction that it is for so many of the rest of us? Yeah, Steve, very good question. Uh, my wife, Susan, and I love children, and in fact, we have 12 godchildren, a number of them... Uh, I think you may have even heard one of them. I did at your book launch. At, at the book yeah, launch. She was great. So uh, the reality, though, is that Susan's career, uh, which in many respects mirrored mine, uh, quite literally, she went to work for the Briefing Council office when I started at the council, and she stepped down as an associate deputy minister when I left the council. So we were very driven in what we were doing, got huge satisfaction out of it. We never had debates about would it, you know, if if we were fortunate enough to have children, would we say, oh, 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 my, oh, me? No, you know, we're always open to the idea. But the fact of the matter is that uh, a family life would not perhaps have enabled us to do what we did. Having said that, there are all sorts of people with multiple children who have done huge things in life. So I'm not saying that you have to have one in order to not have the other. Gotcha. I can scarcely believe this. You're 82 now? Do I admit that on air? <laughs> I, uh, Whether you admit it or not, it's a fact. <laughs> uh, you look great. You're full of, still full of beans, if I can put it that way. What mission animates your life now? Well, it's a mixture. Uh, part of it is philanthropy. Uh, for the last 25 years, uh, working with the National Gallery of Canada and raising money, getting attract uh, attracting works of art, working with philanthropists in the arts domain, both at the National Arts Center, where I work closely with people like Peter, the great hero, Peter Herendorf, mm -hmm. where we lost recently. Uh, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is public policy, closely associated with the Ivy Business School, uh, deeply involved in North American public policy issues, uh, uh, doing some lecturing, teaching, having sat on some boards. I've pulled back from my boards now. So it's been a very rich life. Did some work for the Vatican uh, in, in, you know, after I left the council. Um, worked with the Canada-Australia Business Council. So, you know, a lot of balls at once. But I always believe what my father used to tell me. He used to give a, a, an Italian translation of a, a general idea that, you know, a rolling stone picks up no moss. <laughs> and that is to be active to the very end. And that there's no such thing as retirement. And there has, I've never really retired. People say, well, you retired from the council. Well, no, I didn't. Uh, I work as many hours now as I did then. Nothing has really changed. So if God gives me good health, working at it, uh, not 24 hours a day, but trying my best, and I've been blessed in that regard. Auguri, Senor D'Aquino. Grazie molto. Molto bene. Let's <laughs> remind people this book is called Private Power, Public Purpose, Adventures in Business, Politics, and the Arts, and we're delighted that it's brought Thomas D'Aquino to our studio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Much appreciated. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.